From there he, that's Abram, Abram moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going toward the Negev. Now there was a famine in the land. So Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, I know that you're a woman beautiful in appearance, and when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife, and they will kill me, but let you live. Say you are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you, and that my life may be spared for your sake. And when Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. And when the princes of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And for her sake, he dealt well with Abram. And he had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male servants, female servants, female donkeys, and camels. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. So Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister so that I took her for my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. And Pharaoh gave men orders concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. So Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot with him into the Negev. Now Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold, and he journeyed on from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai, to the place where he had made an altar at the first. And there Abram called upon the name of the Lord, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My name's John, if we haven't met, and we, a few, few weeks ago at the beginning of the season of Lent, we jump back into Genesis, and we've been in Genesis uh, off and on for going on a year now. We hop out to focus on a few other sermons or sermon series, but we've been coming back. It's a long book, and we're going to be in it for a while, so rather than just plowing through verse by verse nonstop, expect more of that, some, some gaps, some, some timeouts, but then, but then a return. So... With the beginning of the story of Abram, let me start like this. I was talking actually to Jeff and Alex Manns yesterday evening about Elvis because they're watching uh, the movie Elvis that came out with Tom Hanks and uh, the guy who played Elvis, who apparently was pretty good, which I haven't seen yet, but I have been to Graceland. Has anybody been to Graceland in Memphis? Only Larry, Jeff, Larry, okay, and, and, and Kara. That's right, because you lived in Memphis for a while. Well, we were visiting a family that went to Liberty a long time ago, and I didn't necessarily care much about, about Graceland and care a little bit about Elvis, but I went because it's apparently something that you do when you're in Memphis. And you go into this, what was at the time, at the end of Elvis's life, a pretty amazing house, and you, you pay this entry fee, and you get this self-guided tour of Elvis's house with an iPad that like guides you through the different rooms and the bathrooms. He's got like a a movie theater in his basement, which like nobody had in 1977. Um, and, and you're making your way through, through his house and his estate toured by the voice of none other than John Stamos. And I'm glad some people laughed at John Stamos because I'm a little bit worried sometimes that the weight of John Stamos is getting lost in our culture. But anyway, he's the one, he's the one guiding you through Graceland. And here's the crazy thing. I'm waiting for the part where they talk about how sad things were at the end of Elvis's life. And like how he could hardly stand up or sing clearly at his last few concerts. And how it was really pretty sad that he died alone and really suddenly uh, in the bathroom <laughs> upstairs. And they talked about none of that. They talk about none of, the, none of the sad or failure parts of his life. It was only a place of, of glory. And I think there's an idea that's out there when you come to the scriptures, that when you look at the lives of some of the quote-unquote heroes of scripture, it's like Graceland and Elvis. Like, it's only the awesome stuff. And it's only the, the, the things where they, like, amazingly did the right thing every time, and it's only the heroic stories. But it's not that 
with the heroes and heroines, if you want to call them that, of Scripture. This is a story where things go bad really, really quickly. And they go really bad. The story we entered last week was Abram, by all accounts, probably a pretty wealthy man, getting called by God to do something fairly radical, which is go to this unknown land, Canaan, where he's never been before, where no one he knows lives. And he says yes. It's like this bold move of faith, and God immediately gives him this incredible promise. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless your, off, bless your offspring. Anybody else who blesses you, I'm going to bless. Anybody who curses your offspring, I'm going to curse. And through this, through this lineage of yours, I'm going to bless the entire world. Great. High point. Immediate low point after that. And that's what we're going to read about today. We're still at the story of this uh, the beginning of the story of Abram, but if you're not familiar with the scriptures or you're just beginning to, to, to open them for yourself and make your way through the Old or New Testament of the Bible, this guy's influence is everywhere. Abram, he's, he's the first patriarch of Israel. He is the father of the nation of Israel. Once you get to the New Testament, it's all of our Bible after the birth and life and death and resurrection of Jesus. Uh, he's, he's not less esteemed. Uh, he's called by the Apostle Paul the the man of faith. If you're looking at uh, this faith hall of fame in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, uh, towards the end of that book in the New Testament, there's this list of these people in, uh, in Israel's history who exercised great faith. And Abram has like, more than twice as many verses about him than anybody else, like Moses or, uh, or, any, or anybody else. He's the man of faith. But his story is not spotless, and it's definitely not easy. Again, last week, these were the words of God to him. Go from your country to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And Abram goes. He says yes with his feet. But it's right after he says yes with his feet, and he actually goes that we find out how much like us Abram sometimes is. As soon as Abram says yes, he finds out he really didn't know what yes meant. He actually had no idea what he was getting into. And he had no idea what kind of journey he was beginning. And that's actually our story too. We actually don't really know. It's almost not fair, you can put it that way. Um, Jesus comes on the scene in Matthew 4, in Luke 5, in John 1, in Mark 1, and he goes to these fishermen and he says, leave everything and follow me, and they do, and they pretty much immediately don't know what they've just done. It ends up being a blessing, but they have no idea what they've signed up for, and, and one of the things I want to commend to you this morning, and I will not apologize for this being an uncomfortable truth, that for anyone who says yes to Jesus in this way, and he's been calling people you know, for, for millennia now, many in this room included, you can't necessarily know what in the world that's going to mean for your life to the end, because it's a call for life. And I think some of us need to be sobered about that. Like the life of faith is often saying, oh my goodness, what have I gotten myself into by saying yes to this Jesus. And that's the story of the man of faith, Abram. What happens? I'll just say life happens. Famine happens. As soon as they get to, well, as soon as they get to Canaan, he builds an altar. It seems everywhere he goes. It says he was uh, between this place that actually came later to be known as Bethel and this, this region called Ai, and he builds an altar. And that just means, God, you brought me here this far. My life is yours. What I have is yours. I worship you, and I dedicate this place to you. And then he moves again, it says, and he does it again. He builds another altar, if you're reading all the way through from the beginning of chapter 12. And then famine hits. Like, right after God brought him to the place where he obediently went, famine hits, and he feels the need to leave. So the, the family goes to Egypt, which happened a lot. There was this temptation, or 
or natural inclination, depending on whether it was obedient or not for the people of God to do this, there's always this instinct to go to Egypt because in the promised land where God was often calling his people and ultimately called the whole nation, you had to rely a lot on rain, but what you had in Egypt was the Nile. There's this alternative way of getting crops irrigated, so you tend to have famine not hurt quite as bad if you went to, to Egypt. So that's what they do. They go to Egypt, and as soon as they get there, Abram realizes that his life is in danger because, one, he's an outsider. He's an unknown person, and he's pretty wealthy, so that uh, immediately draws eyes. Secondly, he has a beautiful wife, Sarai, so he tells her to act like you're my sister. She actually was his kin by lineage, but it's a half-truth. She's his wife. He says, act like you're not so they don't kill me, presuming that uh, their lives will be saved. But what ends up happening is Sarah is put in, 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 in a terrible situation. It seems like she's put into Pharaoh's harem with whoever Pharaoh wants to sleep with that week. And what ends up happening is they get locked up in Egypt. Just think about this for a second. You're Abram. You're in Egypt. You tell Pharaoh, who wants your wife, she's my sister, he sends his men to take her. It's not like when the famine's over, you can just be like, all right, Pharaoh, Pharaoh we're out now. Could you please have, please have my sister return to me so we can leave now? No, they're there's nowhere now for them to go. They are locked in. So just, let's just count for a second how many things have gone wrong. One, there's, there's famine. There's not enough to eat. Two, God has promised that a child will come from this family. And this wife of his isn't even his wife anymore. So family's gone. Food's gone. Family's gone. Uh, they're no longer able to worship anymore. This, you got to read between the lines a little bit more. There are all these notes about Abram building altars on the way to Canaan and in Canaan. And then as soon as they get out again in early chapter 13, that's why we went all the way through 13.4, the first thing he does when he gets back is he builds an altar. There is no altar building in Egypt. You actually learn more about this in the book of Exodus where um, the Israelites are trying to get out. Uh, and the reason Moses and Aaron, where they go, when they go to Pharaoh and ask for the people to be able to leave, is so they can go into the wilderness to worship. And Pharaoh says, well, why don't they just worship as slaves right here? And they say, no, because our worship is an abomination to the Egyptians. It's more than we can get into now. But worship is also taken away from them. And they're kind of slaves, right? Food, family, their God, their freedom, all gone. How is it possible at all for God's promise to be fulfilled? It's totally unclear. It would seem that God has brought them into a dead end. There is a lot, let me say, uh, there is a lot of dispute uh, through the history of interpretation of these, these verses of Scripture about whether what Abram did was sinful the first few hundred years of church history, nobody thinks so. All of the, the church, this is Augustine, this is John Chrysostom, this is uh, Didymus the Blind, Ambrosiaster, if you're familiar with any of these writers. They all uniformly say, what were they going to do? Later, people have looked again and they're like, you know, what would it have looked like for them to have stayed put and trusted God through famine? I got to say, this is one of those pas passages where I have to say, I'm not sure. I don't know if it was wrong for Abram and Sarai to leave. And it's not because I haven't studied hard enough. There's going to be these times where you don't really know what was going on in the motives. Because guess what? There's not a syllable in the text about what their motives were. Like a lot of particularly Old Testament passages. It just says what happened. It doesn't say what was going on in their hearts. But here's what you can know about for sure that no one in the history of interpretation has ever doubted. This is a trial by fire of their very new faith in God. This is a trial by fire. One of the things that a trial reveals to you and me is how limited our yes is to God in the first place. You hear about God, you hear about the gospel, you read about the life of Jesus Christ in the scriptures, maybe you know some Christians, you see how there's something in their life that might be 
helpful for yours. You start to explore Christianity. You go to a worship gathering. Maybe there's a few emotional highs. Maybe not. Maybe it's going okay for a while. Maybe you say, you know what? I've been following myself or some media mogul or influencer or or whatever, I'm just following through life in a way that seems good to me. I think there's something to this Jesus guy. I'm going to say yes to him and follow him. One of the things that necessarily happens in that journey of faith, I've said it again, I've said it before, I'm going to say it again, it's not going to be the last time in this sermon, is God will reveal to you how you don't yet know what that means how much in your heart you have yet to give him and how much in your heart he's still inviting for you to give him. And that's this story. I'll put it this way. Famines reveal. Famines reveal what our yes to God actually means. Testing of our faith is not God being cruel Testing our faith is not God being cruel. The testing of our faith is the only way that we learn to follow him after a momentary curiosity or an emotional high. Or for some of us, maybe just being brought along with our parents to church when we were children. Famines reveal faith and they refine faith. One of the phrases that pops up often in marriage literature, um, there was actually a book about marriage that came out, it's written by Paul Tripp. F- forgive me if I'm wrong, but I think the title was, I've read so many books about marriage. W- isn't it called, What Did You Think It Would Be Like? Did anybody else read that book by Paul Tripp? I think it's called, What Did You Expect? What Did You Expect? I'm sorry. Thanks, Mandy. Clearly reads more books about marriage than I do. What Did You Expect? But that, why is that the title? Because that's a phrase that's out there. Well, what did you expect it was going to be like? What are the vows? For richer or poorer, in sickness or in health, for better or for worse, do you really think on the eve of your wedding that you have any idea what that means? You have no idea what that means, and you still don't know all that it could mean if you're married or if you're thinking about it. There's no way. It's it's when it moves from an idea in your head that sounds so romantic, I'd do anything for you. I mean, Meatloaf sang it. We still know about Meatloaf, right? You, You can't, it's when it moves from your head down into your gut. Forget about your heart. Famine's about your gut. This is poorer. This is worse. This is sickness. I thought it was supposed to be about good. But it was also always supposed to feel awesome. Think about what we're saying. And this is only one illustration, of course. And I'm not saying, by, by the way, I'm not saying that the only problem with any failed or troubled marriage is just somebody's lack of resolve when things, gets hard, when things get hard. That, that's not what I'm saying. But one of the primary ways that a marriage grows is through a famine of finance, of health, of emotional highs and lows. This is the way with our faith as well. I've I've put it this way before. Um, Did you ever read an autobiography where it started out, started out really good, and and then the person's life got better and better and better, and then it just got awesome? The end. This is, ne- this is never, an, it's not your life, it's fantasy, it's never a book that you would read, and the world is in too much of a crucible for that to be any kind of, any kind of strength for living, whether you have faith in Christ or not. And the gospel, the story of what God is doing for the world in Jesus, is the true story of how he doesn't go around that or above that or under it, but right through it, taking you and me with him, saying, don't let go. I know it hurts. Don't let go. We're going through it together to a glorious place that would be less glorious if you let go 
or ignored or just understated it or said, no, it's not that bad. He brings you through it. Here's another one. Whenever we're reading a story about Egypt, um, I mean, Egypt a lot of the time is, is the bad guy in Scripture. <laughs> it's the place where uh, Israel gets stuck. Here, the father of Israel gets stuck. Later on, it's where the entire nation gets stuck. But one of the things that I like to go back to whenever we're reading about these narratives about Egypt and God's people, I like to go back to the Christians in Egypt today. Because uh, actually in the early centuries of Christianity, Egypt was a massive center of influence for Christian scholars and, 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 and monks. Um, um, and to this day, the Christians in Egypt are, well, many Christians in Egypt form a permanent underclass in Egypt. And uh, many others are not constantly persecuted, but there are uh, occasional flare-ups of quite intense persecution. And one of these flare-ups was around this time of year, about 10 years ago. It was on Palm Sunday, some of you might remember, when the cathedrals, St. Mark's Cathedral, um, one of the most famous cathedrals in Egypt, was packed. And at St. Mark's, there was a terrorist attack and many dozens of people die. There was two simultaneous cathedral terrorist attacks on, on Palm Sunday. And what happened was the very next day, Monday of Holy Week, the week leading up to Easter, what happened? All the other churches in the nation were full. Were full, not empty. Why? Because actually the Egyptian Christians know what yes means in a way that you and I don't necessarily. It's not because they're better. It's because for whatever reason in God's strange providence, permissiveness, and the way he's choosing to bring those believers along right now is to let the fires of the crucible touch them and for them to find out Oh, this is how Christ was treated. And loving in the face of terrorists is part of our bringing light to the world. It's part of our loving our enemies. And we're going to show up for it. Thank you very much. And their light's so bright. They know what yes means because they've been tried over and over and over again. And they're not sadists. They don't, like, love living in pain. But they've found a communion with Christ through it. Because their Savior went through the same thing. And they're pleased to join him in it for the sake of their light and their fellowship with him. Folks, let me end like this. Yes, God is going to try your faith to refine it, like um, St. Peter says uh, in 1 Peter 1, like gold refined in a fire, the purities burn off. And that tarnished glory pops, becomes light to the world. Yes, this is the journey of faith. But here's a good question to ask. Whenever we are getting towards the end of the sermon, and it seems like the main point is, be an awesome Christian. Be awesome. No. no. Is your hope now and in eternity based solely on your ability to exercise perfect faithfulness? No. Because, you see, that would even be hope in yourself. That wouldn't be clinging, clinging to the God of your salvation who brings you through. There is good news in this passage. In this passage, I'm not going outside of this passage. I'm looking in this passage. There is good news in this passage. But here's the thing. It's not so much about Abram or Sarai's yes or no to God. It's not so much about Abram's yes as it is about God's yes to his promise about what he's going to do through them. Here's what I mean. 
God is the one who brings this family right back onto his track. Abram's idea was not, let me tell Pharaoh she's my sister so that he will take her into his harem. And then because she's there, his household will get the plague. And then, then what will happen is he will send me and Sarai out with so much more than we entered Egypt with. That was not his plan. That was God's faithfulness. That was God's yes to what God promised to do through people who had weak faith. Faith that was still on its way to being strengthened. Where it would be, say, in Genesis 22, if you know that passage. The Isaac up the mountain passage. We'll get there. Abram's faith isn't there yet. It's formed in the fires of Egypt. This is about God's yes. Abram does end back, end up back in Bethel, in Canaan, back at that altar that he had built before, east of Bethel. And in the end, Abram and Sarai leave Egypt with more than they had when they went there. Here's the point. God's grace is so big that we do not have it in ourselves to permanently wreck his plans for us. And you know the world doesn't have it in its plans to wreck God's plans for us. That's what this passage is about. Out of sheer grace, God opens up an impossible way. And here's where the good news, what Christians call the gospel, that's what good news, that's what gospel means is good news. This is where what Christians call the gospel really enters. God is faithful. God's faithful, get this, if you're worshiping at the altar in Bethel, God's faithful if you're trapped in Egypt, and God's faithful in famine. We know more about all this than Abram did. We knew that somehow God's promise was to bless the world through Abram's family line and that he needed to put his faith in that gracious promise. But we know more than that because we got the rest of the Bible. We know that Abram's offspring, Jesus Christ, would be the man Abram could never be. The man or woman that you and I can never be because Christ was the Son of God in the flesh. And what do we know about Christ? Christ was the one who really remained faithful in the place of impossible situations, famines, so to speak. Hunger, abandonment, under threat of death, Christ was faithful. At the moment of death on the cross, Christ was faithful, clinging in faith that his own death on a bloody cross would somehow against any interpretation that day, become the best thing that ever happened to the world. He was faithful. His faithfulness is our hope, not our own. So brothers and sisters, here's how your entire faith journey will work. God calls, we say yes, hopefully. God then shows us we have no idea what yes means. So we cling even more closely to his mercy and grace through Jesus. This is your whole life. So let me end like this. And I've, 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 put it this, I've put it this way to you before. I don't know how many more times I'll have to put it to you this way. How can I believe right now in my mess that God is going to work through all this for good? How can I believe that in my mess God is going to work through it for good? I'm going to give you the right answer and then I'm going to give you the real answer. Because there's always both. There's the right answer and there's the real answer. Here's the right answer. You just cling to his promises. You just be faithful all the time. You just never screw up and doubt. Never, ever, 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 ever for one second 
question God's goodness. Be faithful all the time. That is the right answer. <laughs> like it's, it's not like it's a trick answer. That's the right answer. That's what he calls us to. Here's the real answer, though. Here's the real answer. You will learn this lesson not once, not twice. If you're paying attention, you will learn this lesson through trial and error every day for the rest of your life. And the good news is, he'll always keep his arms open for you to come back and say, I left. You're still here. Can't see Delphine. The mystery of our worth and our unworthiness. Like she sang. I'd never heard that song before, by the way. That's the real answer. You will learn this lesson not once, not twice, but repeatedly. And that's the journey we're going to be on with Abram and Sarai. Their initial yes was being strengthened through trial, becoming stronger and stronger as God endures with them and as they continually put their trust in him for second, third, tenth chances and beyond. Don't you always feel it in your gut when something happens like you've never felt it before? We just got out of debt. My mom's sick now. And it's like I never have been brought anywhere by God before. It's like I have to learn it all again. My mom for a while got healed. Praise God. Now my job feels like it's on the rocks again. Or my kid's acting up and nothing works. Or there's violence on my block again. There it is in your gut. Whatever you believe, right down to your gut, it's like you're totally not a believer again. Do you really think that his love for you has changed in that journey from your head to your gut? It has not changed. And that's good news. That's good news. My prayer for us, friends, as we go on this journey between now and the day we see him face to face, even if we don't get that much better at faithfulness, which I actually believe we will, we will learn how amazingly gracious and faithful he is. That's my prayer for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.